Mexi. Good news, everyone. Australia is not on fire this year, and our comrades have been making much better things happen, too. We probably should address the QAnon shaman in the room. I don't have any positive things to say about that brazen display of white supremacy, other than Trump did lose the PGA Tour, a bunch of other business, and is potentially facing a bunch of fines and losing his trophy wife. So just really predictable character arc, wasn't it? But don't let that circus distract you from the actual work that BIPOC and other working class people have been pushing forward this month. The stuff that you don't hear about because it is buried by the spectacle that is capitalist democracy. A community in Colombia is ditching traditional capitalist models in order to build a collective future. In the midst of the Colombian Civil War, a conglomerate of villages in one of the country's deadliest areas has founded the Comunidad de Paz de San Jose de Apartado, a peaceful agricultural community. Asking to be left in peace by both sides, they pledged to neither cultivate illegal drugs nor to assist the government, formally ending any relationship with the government. Tending to the fields alone was too dangerous, so they organized daily trips in groups of 50 or 100 to take care of the cacao trees and harvest their fruits. This was the beginning of their communal effort to regain their territory. What started as mechanisms for protection soon became part of a broader philosophy of life. Members of the peace community have some individual land, but most of the 150 hectares of cacao trees grow in collectively owned plots. Members gather in small groups to tend the different plots, and every Thursday they do any work the community might need, from repairing a roof to planting more cacao trees. All of the produce from the community-owned crops goes into a collective pot, and then the community decides together how to distribute the funds. According to one community member, Paso, the community sells about 50 tons of organic cacao a year to Lush, a British cosmetic company that makes soaps and other products with their cocoa. The position of these farmers remains fragile and would not be so successful without the international attention they've received thanks to not-for-profit groups. However, they have successfully demonstrated how solidarity and community ownership and control of productive resources can help bring hope and stability to even the most threatened communities. Paso says this is a life project. We're not doing this only for ourselves, but also for the new generation. Thanks to the immense pressure that Indian farmers and comrades have placed on Modi's government through the largest protest in human history, which we reported on last month, the Indian government has suspended three neoliberal agricultural reforms that triggered the protests. Although the laws are only being suspended for 18 months, this is a win for protesters who left the government no choice, and they've made it clear that should they want to, they can shut down the country again. What a fantastic show of worker power in the face of Modi's right-wing repression. The labor movement took a crucial step forward in the notoriously anti-worker Silicon Valley this month, with more than 400 Google employees forming a minority union after years of growing activism in one of the world's largest tech companies. The Alphabet Workers Union, named after Google's parent company, was formed in secret over the past year and is affiliated with the Communications Workers of America, which represents workers in telecom and media. As a minority union, the Alphabet Workers Union does not yet have the power to negotiate contracts with management, however, organizers said it exists to give space and endurance to activism at Google. Google employees have been increasingly vocal about policy overhauls on pay, harassment, diversity, and ethics. In 2018, 20,000 workers staged a walkout over Google's mishandling of sexual harassment in the workplace. Hopefully, this fledging union will grow into a powerful force for labor in Silicon Valley. Amazon workers at certain warehouses in France, Italy, Spain, and Poland who have little economic choice but to work through the pandemic are striking over low pay, grueling working conditions, and risk of infection. Because of skyrocketing demand, workers are expected to work overtime, even in Italy, where a stay-at-home order is in effect. Although the company has said that they have increased cleaning and enacted social distancing protocols, several warehouse workers in Italy and Spain have tested positive for COVID-19. Workers in Poland are particularly pissed because because they have not seen the hourly wage increase that Amazon has enacted in other European countries. We reported on potential unionization at an Amazon in Alabama last month, as well as strikes across Germany, and honestly, try as they might, the anti-union corporate hacks at Amazon cannot stop what is coming. Heighten the contradictions enough and find out. 
the Washtenaw County prosecutor in Ann Arbor, Michigan, is no longer pursuing charges against consensual sex work. The prosecutor's office hopes that the policy change will encourage the reporting of actual sex crimes, such as physical or sexual assault, human trafficking, and crimes involving children. It's been well established that criminalization of sex work increases the adjacent harm associated with the work. This makes sense because if sex workers are seen as criminals, they are far less likely to come forward with instances of violence. The decriminalization of sex work has been called for by Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and the American Civil Liberties Union, as well as legions of activists for decades, and that work is starting to bear fruit. Workers at the Hunts Point Produce Market, who are part of Teamsters Local 202, are celebrating this month as they have reached a tentative settlement on a new three-year contract. Over 1,400 workers had voted to strike over a wage dispute, arguing that they deserved a wage increase as they were working nonstop to keep New York City's food supply going during the pandemic. Women's rights activists in Pakistan are rejoicing as the Lahore High Court has banned the use of virginity tests on rape survivors with vaginas in a landmark ruling. The court ruled that the hymen tests were invasive and an infringement on the privacy of a woman to her body. I will editorialize and say also anyone with a vagina. In the verdict, Justice Aisha A. Malik said that it is a humiliating practice which is used to cast suspicion on the victim as opposed to focusing on the accused and the incident of sexual violence. She's ordered an immediate suspension of the practice. At a time when Poland's proto-fascist government has ramped up anti-LGBT rhetoric, Krakow has become the first city in Poland to finance an LGBT support shelter. The city of Krakow is giving some 184,000 zlotys, which coincidentally are PLNs, wink wink, to keep the shelter afloat over the next two years. This translates into about 40,000 euros. Currently, the facility offers shelter and psychological counseling for up to 12 homeless LGBT people. It may be small, but it's a start and has already set a trend. The mayor of Warsaw signed a declaration of support for the LGBT community in 2019 and is set to offer municipal funding to a similar support shelter, despite backlash from the deeply conservative ruling party coalition. The European Court of Human Rights ruled that Romania was in violation of transgender rights this month. The court ruled against Romania for failing to grant two transgender citizens requests for recognition of their gender identity, asking them to furnish proof that they had undergone gender reassignment surgery. The court observed that the national courts had presented the applicants who did not wish to undergo gender reassignment surgery with an impossible dilemma. Either they had to undergo the surgery against their better judgment, or they had to forego recognition of their gender identity the ECHR said in a statement. This goes against Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which upholds the right to respect for private and family life. They ordered Romania to pay 8,563 euros in damages to one plaintiff and 7,500 euros to the other, as well as costs. A statue of Abraham Lincoln standing over a kneeling freed African slave was removed from Boston's Park Square this month. Boston officials voted to dismantle the 141-year-old monument after sustained pressure from anti-racist activists. The statue was an absurd display of white saviorism and helped solidify, literally, the trope that African slaves were passive actors in their emancipation rather than active resistors and fighters. The statue will likely be moved to an educational setting like a museum where its context can be properly explained. May all monuments to white supremacy be given similar treatment or, you know, melted down. In a huge win for racial and economic justice, Illinois is set to become the first state to end cash bail. Cash bail, a practice of punishing the poor who have not been convicted of crimes with jail time just because they cannot afford to post bail, has been used by the government to restrict the freedom and rights of BIPOC people since, you know, jails were a thing in America. When this law is signed by the governor, everyone accused of a crime in Illinois will be eligible for release, and the state will have strict restrictions on who can be incarcerated before a trial. With this precedent set, this law will likely snowball to other states, threatening one important pillar of institutional racism. As almost anyone who's participated in anti-racist, anti-capitalist, anti-colonial, or anti-fascist protests know, cops routinely hide their badge numbers in order to more easily get away with abusing their power. But technology has now reached the point where the very same surveillance techniques used by the police can be harnessed by the little guy. I already reported on one activist working on developing this technology to ID cops in Portland, but turning the tables on the state, tech activists around the globe are now 
working collaboratively on facial recognition software that can ID cops who hide their badge numbers. Cops cannot count on avoiding public scrutiny for much longer. Of course, they can always hide their faces and badge numbers, but with issues like defunding and abolishing the police exploding into the mainstream, doing so would only make these calls even louder. This isn't really a win, but it's interesting to note that BP Oil, OPEC, and other oil execs are thinking that humanity has already reached peak oil consumption and that it may never again reach the height that it had in 2019. Due to everyone hunkering down during the COVID-19 pandemic, not commuting, not flying, etc., we saw the sharpest drop in oil consumption since the invention of the automobile. At its best, global demand dropped by a staggering 29 million barrels per day. Oil execs believe that COVID has accelerated long-term trends that are transforming where our energy comes from and that some of those changes will be permanent. Even though a peak is not guaranteed, Faith Birol, who leads the IEA, told Bloomberg that the value of oil is going down and oil-dependent economies have to prepare themselves before it's too late. Uh, Justin? Hello? Like any forecast, only time will tell if peak oil demand happened already or won't come until 2040. However, that inescapable uncertainty is less important than the newfound agreement among capitalists that a turning point is here. Potentially reflecting this turning point is the next story. Although Trump was able to pull off some egregious crap on his way out of office, he wasn't able to complete his anti-environment agenda. His administration endeavored to open the Arctic National Wildlife Reserve to fossil fuel development, but only half of the 22 available oil and gas leases received bids, and the state of Alaska accounted for all but two of them. Adam Colton, executive director of the Alaska Wilderness League, called the lease sale an epic failure for the Trump administration administration and the Alaska congressional delegation. In addition, lawsuits filed by environmental groups against Trump's plan to redefine 18 million acres of wildlife reserve as eligible for drilling are pending, and Biden says that he is opposed to drilling in the refuge. Speaking of, after over a decade of organization and fierce resistance in the face of brutal state violence, the indigenous-led movement was successful in ending the Keystone XL pipeline. Just hours after being sworn in, Biden signed an executive order that terminated the permit allowing expansion of the pipeline to continue. Gotta admit, it feels cynical to see a neoliberal take a stand against oil and gas interests, but hey, we will take it. Alberta's premier, Jason Kenney, is furious with the decision. His quote-unquote fiscally conservative government poured $1.1 billion into the project. That is money that could have been spent on healthcare, paid sick leave, pandemic safety, or a just transition for former oil workers whose jobs are not coming back. So if you're looking for sympathy, Mr. Premier, kindly piss off. In the Netherlands, Shell is being taken to court at The Hague by the Dutch arm of Friends of the Earth, representing more than 17,000 claimants. For context, the Dutch government was ordered to reduce its emissions by at least 25% from 1990 levels by the end of 2020, and under the Paris Climate Agreement, the European Union has committed to reducing its greenhouse gas emissions by at least 40% by 2030. The claimants therefore conclude that Royal Dutch Shell's corporate policy is on a collision course with global climate targets, said Roger. Roger Cox, a lawyer representing the claimants. Shell is being accused of breaking the law by intentionally impeding the country in reaching its targets. Shell's attempted defense is that it is no more responsible for solving the climate emergency than other businesses or individuals, which is, of course, completely absurd coming from one of the 10 biggest polluters in the world. Hopefully the case will inspire others to put greater pressure on governments and corporations to aggressively reduce emissions at this critical moment in the climate crisis. After more than a century of violent colonial dispossession, the Nez Perce tribe is reclaiming an ancestral village in eastern Oregon. This month, the tribe purchased 148 acres of their ancestral territory, known as the Place of Boulders, where the tribe's ancestors camped and caught sockeye salmon along the Waloa River. The U.S. Army forced the Nez Perce to leave the area in 1877 in violation of a treaty that granted the tribe millions of acres to continue their ways of life. Today, the land is considerably altered by a dam which blocks salmon from swimming up the Waloa Lake. The tribe hopes to create new fish passage to the lake and reintroduce sockeye to the area. Of course, it is a travesty that the tribe had to buy back land that is theirs, but certainly the return is to be celebrated. 
In Brazil's northern state of Para, the capital city of Belém just elected Edmilson Rodriguez, a member of the Socialism and Freedom Party, as their mayor. Hitting the ground running, his municipal government has unanimously approved a basic income of 450 reals for folks in extreme poverty. Fantastic. Back in 2016, when arch-conservative Paul Ryan of Wisconsin was Speaker of the GOP-controlled House, he said before that year's election, if we lose the Senate, do you know who becomes the chair of the Senate Budget Committee? A guy named Bernie Sanders. You ever heard of him? Indeed we have Paul, and Bernie, the people's zady himself, has been appointed to the chair of the Senate Budget Committee. I know some were hoping for him to be appointed Labor Secretary, but he can probably be much more effective in pushing a working class agenda in his new position, given that Robert Reich was basically ignored for his entire tenure as Labor Secretary in the Clinton administration. Sanders has vowed to use his position to come up with the most aggressive reconciliation bill to address the suffering of the American working families today. Time will tell how much good will be done for working people through this mechanism, but apparently the budget committee chair has a procedural tool that allows them to pass legislation with a simple majority. If the Republicans use this tool to deliver tax breaks to the ultra-rich, there's no reason it can't be used to raise the federal minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour, among many other much-needed policies. If we do not force the Biden administration to implement a working-class agenda, we will more likely than not end up with a much worse Trump figure in four years' time. WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange was given a victory this month when a UK judge denied a US request to extradite the famed whistleblower. The judge denied the request on the grounds that the special administrative measures in which Assange would be held in America would have a severe negative impact on his already diminished mental health. This is an extremely important case with regards to press freedom. Trump, of course, did not pardon Assange on his way out of office, so hopefully Biden declines to press to extradite him. Former governor of Michigan Rick Snyder, his health health director and other ex-officials are being charged after a new investigation into the Flint water scandal, which contaminated the city's water with lead. This devastated the community and caused an outbreak of the deadly Legionnaire's disease. The water crisis started in 2014 when Snyder's government decided to switch Flint's water source from the treated Detroit Water and Sewerage Department to the untreated Flint River without applying corrosion inhibitors in the name of fiscal responsibility. I'm sure you all remember the now famous images of the water coming out of of those taps and Obama's sick performative act of quote-unquote solidarity with the community. Six years later, Snyder and eight other officials were finally charged with 34 felony counts and seven misdemeanors for their roles in the crisis, with two officials charged with involuntary manslaughter. It's going to take a lot more material restitution, though, to bring justice to the residents of Flint. Parler, the far-right alternative to Twitter, which unsurprisingly degenerated into a cesspool of racism and conspiracy theories, was dropped by every hosting service after it was found to be instrumental in the organization and outreach for the white riot on Capitol Hill. Fearing it could be used to spread more violent content, Google, Apple, and Amazon severed business ties with the fledging alt social media platform. That seemed to be the end for Parler, but it has since been rehosted with very limited functionality under the web hosting company Epic. The good news, though, is that right before Parler was dropped by mainstream capitalist companies, the hacker Donk Enby and her associates managed to archive every post by every Parler user. Deleted videos even contained GPS metadata, letting anyone know the exact location of where videos were taken. Now, every Parler user who potentially incriminated themselves on film may just have their actions come back to bite them in the ass. And lastly, I would be remiss if I did not at least mention GameStonk, not because it was truly leftist or revolutionary, but because it was actually a powerful moment of education and agitation, exposing how Wall Street and finance capital really operate and working to build class consciousness. Honestly, if the big bourgeoisie keeps showing its hand to this degree, we'll see a lot more people joining our struggle. Comrades, if you have good news from the current month, please send me your stories at veganvanguardpodcast at gmail.com or at me at MexiYT on Twitter. Thank you to Javi for the positive news jams. Thank you to Halcyon for the positive news background. And thank you to Tristan for editing this video. Thank you also to our lovely patrons. We've launched a dedicated Patreon for PLN with some cute and very cool perks. Thank you to Ben, Liz, Steven, Rodrigo, and Sardon of ACAB for your generous support. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe, and I will see you in another video.